I again, we were on our second last week in Galatians, and I feel again it's almost ditto. Paul goes uh, again on again and again about the freedom and how we cannot let the law uh, bind us or, or stop us from, from growing in the love of Christ. He talks about how Christ came to fulfil the law um, so as we may not no longer be bound by it. And so he, he talks a lot about that again this week. But the, t the topic this week is um, free, free to love. And so as many of you will know, and I've shared before, I love my action movies. And when I hear the word freedom, I immediately think of the cry from the blue painted face of William Wallace, played by Mel Gibson in the film Braveheart. When the Scots are fighting for their freedom against the English, he is rallying the troops with that fire in his eyes and he addresses the Scottish troops that are assembled there but who are very afraid to fight. He says, you've come to fight as free men and free men you are. What will you do with that freedom? Will you fight? Fight and you may die. Run and you'll live at least a while. And dying in your beds many years from now, would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that for one chance, just one chance to come back here to tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they will never take our freedom. It's, a, it's, a, it's an image and a scene that, that as soon as I heard the word freedom, that is what comes to mind. And if that image isn't powerful enough, then at the end of the movie, after being mercilessly tortured, his tormentors give him one last opportunity to ask for mercy and a swift death. And movingly and powerfully, he summons up all the courage and all the strength of his body will allow him and yells out again, freedom. We are so blessed here in Australia. I don't think we appreciate freedom until we are actually denied it. And we've had a tiny glimpse of that recently with these COVID restrictions during this pan pandemic in lockdown. It hasn't been as bad for us up here as for our Melbourne friends, but they've only been allowed out one hour a day for a walk, only for essential items. We haven't been able to gather or connect with others freely for which we are created. And we know a little of losing, so we do know a little of losing some of our freedom. And here at the start of Galatians 5, Paul says, stand firm, which is a military term meaning to hold the line, be strong, resist the attack, stick together, hold the fort. Remember when you were a kid and you played tug of war on the grass and in order to get some traction, you had to dig deep with your feet and dig your heels into the dirt. If Paul rode a horse, I could see him riding in, rallying the Galatian churches and yelling at the top of his voice, freedom, it is for freedom that Christ died and has set us free. So do not let yourselves be again burdened by the yoke of slavery. Do not forfeit or give up your freedom because it cost Christ so much. Why would you want to return to circumcision, to having to prepare sacrifices, to be careful in how you prepared food and in what you ate, in having to dress a certain way and in having to observe certain times and certain practices? Not only would these things take up so much time, but they would take us away from what is really important, from loving God and loving others. The Galatians taking back what they had been freed from would be like us at the end of this pandemic when we had a, found a vaccine and we didn't have to worry anymore. It'd be like us still deciding to socially distance, to still knock our elbows together in greeting or to still wear a face mask and still to race home to get home by nine o'clock. Why would we, if we didn't have to, continue on with all those restrictions and laws? Would they provide us with a sense, a false sense of security? Would they help alleviate our fear? 
Here again, Christ died so as we might not so as we might not have to be afraid. His perfect love casts out all fear. He has fulfilled the law by putting an end to us needing to be enslaved by it. I told the story of the black bear a few weeks ago. When he got his lush new green grass caged, he only walked 10 metres into it, the size of his old concrete cage, because he preferred the restriction, the familiar, the safe, the comfortable. Did the freedom Christ offered scare the Galatians? Did they prefer being instructed by the law about how to live their lives? Did they feel safer than having a day-to-day -day relationship or a moment-by-moment -moment relationship with the living Lord Jesus? How do we feel about that? Can we live fully in the freedom that God offers us or is it too risky? Does it demand too much of us? Is it easier to follow unthinkingly a set of rules? It can seem foreign, but that is what we were created for, for freedom in a relationship with Christ. What's Jesus set us free from? We've been set free from the burden and, sin, uh, and guilt of our sin. We're free from the penalty and power of our sin. We've been set free from empty and meaningless religion. We've been set free from fear-based behaviour modification. And we're free to call God Abba, Father, Daddy. We are his children. And we're free to approach the throne of grace with confidence. And we're set free from the fear of death. We no longer fear that God doesn't love us when we fail. We live in the freedom knowing that grace covers those failures. Is that the freedom that you know and live and experience in Christ? Once we understand that, Romans 8 becomes much more than just a verse to memorise. Therefore now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering for us. And from our John reading, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the good news of the gospel. We are free from the burdens of the law and have been set free to obey God out of love and not out of fear. We need to stand firm and protect our freedom in Christ. Martin Luther said one of the best ways that we can do this is by preaching the gospel to ourselves every day. Then Paul gives them a negative command do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. With all that our freedom entails, Paul tells them to not go backwards on their spiritual journey. The race finishes by looking forward. Paul understands the yoke of the law. He lived under it his whole life prior to meeting Jesus. He pictures an oxen weighted down with a heavy yoke to the point where he can't, they can't go forward. We are free and we don't have to live under that weight. The only way to be enslaved again is to volunteer. Paul says again, because once they had been enslaved by pagan religions, now the Judah, Judaizers were trying to enslave them again. And Jesus described the Pharisees this way in Matthew 23, 4 and verse 15. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you've succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. This was the mission of the Pharisees. But Jesus, he offers us a different kind of yoke. 
Beautiful words from Matthew. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I am humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It will not weigh you down. Paul warns them if they choose circumcision, they were choosing works over grace. Circumcision was like a gateway drug into legalism. It was Jesus and circus, Jesus plus circumcision, but as we've said other weeks, it is Jesus plus nothing that equals salvation. Last week, Ray spoke about Sarah and Hagar, and there is no middle ground. You are a descendant of one or the other. The choice is perfection by the law or repentance through grace. We cannot keep the law and that is why Christ fulfilled the law for us. Every single rule perfectly and then he credited it to our account. That is why it doesn't make sense to go back. Then in the second half of this Galatians passage, Paul starts to speak about what Christian freedom looks like and how to live it through the Spirit. The Holy Spirit allows us to experience the presence of Christ living in us and unites our lives with his. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Because Christ lives in us by the Spirit, we are free to enjoy being obedient to God. We're not set free to do whatever we want to do, and there are people that say, hey, I'm free, I can do whatever I want, and God will forgive me. That's his job. Paul says this attitude in the Church of Rome, and he didn't stand for it one minute. He saw it there. From the message, Romans 6, 15 to 18. Since we're out from under the old tyranny, does that mean we can live in any old way we want? Since we're free in the freedom of God, can we do anything that comes to mind? Hardly. You know well enough from your own experience that there are some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. Offer yourselves to sin, for instance, and it's your last free act. But offer yourselves to the way of God and the freedom never ends. All your lives you've let sin tell you what to do. But thank God you've started listening to a new master, one whose commands set you free to live openly in his freedom. And we live through love. Paul slams the door on circumcision with these verses. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. There's a story told of a man who went to the slave market to buy a slave in 1865. He selected a young girl and he bought her. And when she came to meet him, he smiled and said, you are free. I paid the price for you and now I choose to set you free. And the young girl couldn't believe her ears. Free to do whatever I want, she asked wide-eyed. Yes, free to do whatever you want. Free to say whatever I want, she asked. Yes, free to say whatever you want, he replied. Free to go wherever I want, she asked with tears in her eyes. Yes, free to go wherever you want, he said, trying to hold back his own tears. She stared at him for a minute and finally grabbed his hand and said, it's decided then, I will go with you. This is what Christ offers us and this is all he wants in repayment, us to follow him and serve him freely. Paul must have been a big sports fan because he uses lots of sporting images like wrestling and boxing, but his favourite seems to be running the race. Paul says to the Galatians, you were running well, running to the rhythm of grace. You had your head up and your shoulders back and you were breathing steady, and you were doing great, but what happened? Who cut in on you? Who tripped you up? 
A race in Paul's day wasn't run around an oval track, but to a stick and back. Obviously, tripping was against the rules, but as you approached the stick, it was nearly impossible to not get jostled around a little. And this was what was happening here to the Galatians, although theirs was deliberate and intentional. The false teachers, the Judaizers, are cutting in on them, trying to trip them up with false doctrine and from obeying the truth. They were really telling them that they had to be circumcised in order to be a real Christian. To do this would be to say that Christ's death on the cross was not sufficient and Paul wasn't going to stand for that. And most of the book of Galatians bears witness to his resolve in this. Jesus said that his sheep know his voice. My sheep listen to my voice, I know them and they follow me in John 10. Let's make it our aim to know Jesus' voice so well that when another voice tries to persuade us away from the truth, we'll know it immediately. False teachers can contaminate the whole church. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. In Jewish thought, yeast, yeast represented the corrupting power of sin. I heard a story of kids pestering their mum about wanting to watch a movie that only had a little bit of swearing and only a little bit of nudity. When she said no, they said, oh, that's not fair, it's only a little bit. It wouldn't ruin the whole movie. The next day, she made them some brownies and she offered them to her kids. She said, I want you to know that these brownies are 99% good. I did just put a little bit of dog's poop in the other 1%, but it's just a little, so dig in and enjoy them. The kids learned a lesson that day. The question is, do we? Paul does express confidence in the Galatians. He says God's good and he, and he loves the Galatians and he believes that they won't fall victim ultimately because God will protect them. But he does give a stern warning to the false teachers who would have been present. Quite drastically at the end of the passage, he says they should be emasculated. Luther paraphrases this, I wish that the knife would slip. They will be judged. As a church, can I encourage you to commit to reading the Bible, not because you have to or because you'll get brownie points for it if you do, but so that you will know the truth. You'll be able to, uh, um, be able to um, see any false things. You'll be able to see any lies of the enemy, that you'll know the truth and that it'll be the truth that always sets you free so as you can guard against that false teaching teaching and that says things like this this is the exact date when Christ is returning teaching that tells you it's your fault if you're not healed because you do not have enough faith or teaching that says God's prosperity is equal to lots of money or teaching that says we cannot allow people in our church who live or think differently to us or teaching that says Jesus plus something equals salvation the theme for this week was the freedom to love. Sometimes we can come before God with a false understanding of his love and forgiveness, particularly when we've blown it or done the wrong thing. We need to see God's love as it is free and unconditional. It's not our job to point out how someone might be living wrong. It's our job to say, I love you. God loves you. God is good and you're going to be okay. I want to finish with a story that Philip Yancey tells in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace. It highlights the fear and trepidation of someone who has done wrong and what, re what the appropriate response of a church should be as they are free to love. And our Ephesians reading talks about how big, how wide, how deep and how high and how lavish that love should be. That's the sort of love we need to live in and that's the sort of way, think, um, way we need to be loving the world. We need to be loving those who come across our paths. Anything less and they may miss seeing Jesus. A young girl grows up on a cherry orchard 
just above Traverse City, Michigan. Her parents are a bit old fashioned and they tend to overreact to her nose ring, the music she listens to, her tattoos and the length of her skirts. They ground her a few times and she sees this inside. I hate you, she screams at her father when he knocks on the door of her room after an argument. And that night she acts on a plan that she's mentally rehearsed scores of times in her head. She runs away. She's visited Detroit only once before on a bus trip with her church youth group to watch the, the Tigers play because newspapers in Traverse City report in lurid detail the gangs, the drugs and the violence in downtown Detroit. And so she concludes that this is the safest place for her uh, away from her parents because it's the last place that they will ever look for her. California maybe or Florida, but not Detroit. So she moves there and on her second day there, she meets a man who drives the biggest car she's ever seen. He offers her a ride, buys her lunch, arranges a place for her to stay. He gives her some pills that make her feel better than she's ever felt before. She was right all along, she decides. Her parents were keeping her from all this fun. The good life continues for a month, two months, a year. The man with the big car, she calls him boss, teaches her a few things that men like. Since she's underage, men pay a premium for her. She lives in a penthouse and orders room service whenever she wants. Occasionally she thinks about the folks back at home, but their lives now seem so boring and provincial, she can hardly believe she even grew up there. She has a brief scare when she sees her picture printed on the back of a milk carton with the headline, Have you seen this child? But by now she has blonde hair and with all the makeup and body piercing jewellery she wears, nobody would mistake her for a child. Besides, most of her friends are runaways and nobody squeals in Detroit. After a year, the first sallow signs of illness appear and it ama amazes her how fast the boss turns mean. These days we can't mess around, he growls, and before she knows it, she's out on the street without a penny to her name. She still turns a couple of tricks a night, but they don't pay much and all the money goes to support her habit. When winter blows, she finds herself sleeping on mental grates outside the department stores. Sleeping is the wrong word because a teenage girl at night in downtown Detroit can never relax her guard. Dark bands circle her eyes and her cough worsens. One night as she lays, lies awake listening for footsteps, all of a sudden, everything about her life looks different. She no longer feels like a women, woman of the world. She feels like a little girl lost in a cold and frightening city. She begins to whimper. Her pockets are empty and she's hungry. She needs a fix. She pulls her legs tight underneath her and shivers under the newspaper she's piled atop of her coat. Something jolts in her memory and a single image fills her mind of May in Traverse City when a million cherry trees bloom all at once with her golden retriever dashing through the rows and rows of trees in chase of a tennis ball. God, why did I leave? She says to herself and the pain stabs at her heart. My dog back home even eats better than I do now. She's sobbing and she knows in a flash that more than anything else in the world, she wants to go home. Three straight phone calls, three straight connections with the answering machine. She hangs up without leaving a message the first, few the first two times. But the third time she says, Dad, Mum, it's me. I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way and I'll, it'll get there around midnight tomorrow. If you're not there, well, I guess I'll just stay on the bus until it hits Canada. It takes about seven hours for a bus to make all the stops between Detroit and Traverse City. 
and during that time she realises the flaws in her, pan, in her plan. What if her parents are out of town and, and miss the message? Shouldn't she have waited another day or so until she could talk to them directly? And even if they're at home, they probably wrote her off as dead long ago. She should have given them some time to overcome the shock. Or they'll probably be saying, we told you so, we told you all of this would happen, angry at the grief and the pain that she'd caused them. How would they ever forgive her? Her thoughts bounce back and forth between these worries and the speech she's preparing for her father. Dad, I'm sorry. I know I was wrong. It's not your fault. It's, it's all mine. Dad, Dad, can you please forgive me? She says the words over and over, her throat tightening even as she rehearses them. She hasn't apologised to anyone in years. The bus has been driving with its lights on since Bay City. Tiny snowflakes hit the pavement, rubbed worn by thousands of tyres and the asphalt steams. She's forgotten how dark it gets at night out here. A deer darts across the road and the bus swerves. Every so often a billboard, a sign posting the mileage to Traverse City. Oh, God. When the bus finally rolls into the station, its air brakes hissing in protest. The driver announces in a crackly voice over the microphone, 15 minutes, folks, 15 minutes, that's all we have here. 15 minutes to decide her life. She checks herself in a compact mirror. She smooths her hair and licks the lipstick off her teeth. She looks at the tobacco stains on her fingertips and wonders if her parents will notice. That's if they're even there. She walks into the turn terminal not knowing what to expect. Not one of the thousand scenes that have played out in her mind prepare her for what she sees. There in the concrete walls and the plastic chairs bus terminal in Traverse City, Michigan, stands a group of 40 brothers and sisters and great aunts and uncles and cousins and a grandmother and a great grandmother to boot. They're all wearing goofy party hats and blowing noise, those um, blowers, and taped across the entire wall of the terminal is a computer generated banner that reads, Welcome Home. Out of the crowd of well wishes, her dad steps forward. She stares out through the tears quivering in her eyes like hot mercury and begins this memorised speech. Dad, I'm sorry. I know. And he interrupts her. Hush, child. We've got no time for that. No time for apologies. You'll be late for the party. A banquet's waiting for you at home. We're often accustomed to finding a catch in every promise. But Jesus' story of extravagant grace and lavish love include no catch, no loophole, disqualifying us from God's unconditional love. We too are free to love as God loves. And we can be absolutely certain others will come to know the love of God through us if we love in this way. End of story. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for the message of freedom. We thank you so much for the gift of freedom that you gained for us when you died on the cross, when you settled the account of our debt, when you died in our place. Help us to never, ever, ever forget that. Help us to never, ever, ever go back on how far we've come with you because to do that is to throw back in your face what you did and what you achieved at Calvary, what it cost you. And God, we thank you that that freedom gives us um, the freedom to follow you, but the freedom in following you means to love like you, to love like you, to love others just as you would. 
Oh, Lord, may our freedom cause us to love in the way that you love, freely, unconditionally, mercifully, with grace and in abundance. May we in our own lives know how high, how deep, how wide and how, and how um, extravagant and lavish that your love is, that love that you gave to us. And may we in turn give it to all who we come across. May they not see us, Lord, but may they see you. May they see you, the God of unconditional love, who wants them to come to know you as their Lord and Saviour. Lord, through the power of your spirit, may we live and love as you did. In Jesus' name, amen.